All right, we're going to get started. Um, hopefully everyone got to grab a glass of water or a snack um, as we move on to um, this next session. Um, and so it's a case studies from the field, the intersection of community or urban planning and preservation planning. So um, I'm excited because I am an urban planner by training um, in a school that doesn't teach historic preservation <laughs> at UCLA. But, you know, so I'm glad to see the, this intersection and oftentimes in urban planning um, at major conferences, uh, as I've been uh, witness to, preservation often is left in the margin. Uh, two years ago at the ACSP, uh, our session in historic preservation was actually the last session on the last day. And so we got to, in our panel, we all got to talk to each other and like one other person. Um, and so I'm honored to highlight <laughs> the work we do instead of putting us are being rendered in the margins as usual. And I am thrilled uh, to um, have Willow Long Amam, Dr. Willow Long Amam, uh, here from the University of Maryland, um, be the moderator for our session today. And so I will uh, kick it off to you, Willow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. This has been a really enlightening um, conversation thus far and really happy to be able to move from the federal conversation that you guys just had um, and bring it down to the local level with people who are doing really fascinating work on the ground. Let me briefly introduce myself and then I'll do a very brief introduction um, for each of the speakers whose longer bios you can read in the program booklet. So I am an associate professor of urban studies and planning here in, at the University of Maryland and also director of community development at the National Center for Smart Growth Research and Education. And here today, um, among our panelists, uh, we have a good friend and colleague, uh, Fallon Aidu from the University of New Orleans. Her research um, focuses on revitalization, redevelopment, and retrofit of heritage affected by disinvestment or disasters, especially on main streets and in minority enclaves. She um, both teaches and researches um, in the urban planning, design, and preservation program at New Orleans. And she also is the founder of Studio RXP and a faculty affiliate at UNO's um, Urban Entrepreneurship and Policy Institute. Um, next, we're going to hear from Caroline Chong, who is an assistant professor at the University of Central Florida's History Department. Her research um, spans from historic preservation and economic development, um, and especially focused on the relationship between urban heritage, conservation, um, urban regeneration, and poverty reduction, with a particular focus on the Global South. And finally, we will hear from Laura Dominguez, who um, is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of Southern California. Um, her dissertation is examining the ways that racialized groups in Los Angeles repaired and fra repaired fracture connections to the past through place, unearthing a, a medicinal landscape of memory sites from the 18th through the 21st century. She's also currently a USC Mellon Humanities and Urban um, University of the Future PhD Fellow, and also founding board member for the Latinos in Heritage Conservation. So we have a really diverse set of case studies we're going to work through today, starting with Fallon, whose who's, um, work is entitled Holding Ground Heritage Management Strat Strategies to Restore Black Wall Street. I'll hand it over to you, Fallon. All right. <clears throat> Just a second, everyone. Good afternoon or morning, depending upon where you are in the world. Um, mm -hmm. 
All right. Apologies, this trying to take over my whole screen there. <clears throat> so um, I am Fallon Samuels Adu, and I want to thank Michelle for inviting me to participate in this just such an illustrious company. Um, I originally hail from a black settlement of Piscataway, uh, clearly named after its ancestral st stewards. But today I join you from New Orleans, the homeland of Chickasaw and Homa tribes of Louisiana. And much of what I know about preservation policy, planning and practice, I've learned from uh, black indigenous and immigrant architects of mutual aid in both um, my current home of New Orleans, but my, um, but back home in New England as well. Alan, and, uh, your, your screen is um, distorted, your presentation screen. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's try that again then. Sorry about that. Alan, while you're fixing that, I just wanna know if you're participating in Yardy Gras, are you decorating your home this year? I am not. I'm it's definitely a big not. Under <laughs> okay. Let's do this. That's strange. Okay. What about this time? It's on presenter mode, but it, it's better uh, than earlier because it was yeah. earlier. It was uh, cut off in. I don't weird know why it's doing that mode. Yeah, it's okay, but this is. I mean, this is fine. If <laughs> 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 sorry. I've had a uh, problem before. Okay. So in the interest of time, I will keep it moving. So I have the privilege today of um, of presenting a small part of a sprawling project that I began with last year with um, community partners in Martha's Vineyard, the African American Heritage Trail of Martha's Vineyard, and um, in Tulsa with the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce. And this thing is really. And this project, which focuses on the ways in which businesses have been locating um, in homes and other kind of um, shelter for unhoused people, um, particularly during crisis, has brought me to uh, intersect with quite a bit of a media storm currently uh, underway in Tulsa itself. There's been very little attention to um, what preceded this now historic event of the Black, of the Tulsa's race massacre. But that is these, these more, um, these acts of retreat that preceded that momentous occasion are what gave rise to this particular project that's looking at um, mutual aid amongst African-American business owners who, formed quite organically uh, main streets on um, native lands. And I apologize, I need to pause for a minute because I really am unable to see. Alan, we can also have uh, Karen Yee pull up your presentation if you just want to start from the beginning. No problem. Um, I actually don't have a copy of her PowerPoint in the Google Drive. Hey, I lied. 
All right, so it looks like it just wants to take over my entire screen, um, no matter what I do. So um, <laughs> I apologize. Do you want, do you want me, Fallon, do you want me to go for, and then you can try to figure it out in the next couple minutes? Yes, I would very much appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to do that as long as the powers that be are okay with that. Great. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Caroline and um, Alan, feel free to email any of us your presentation as a backup in the meantime. Okay. So I guess I'll just say really quickly before Caroline begins, the, the title of her presentation is Moving Towards Equity Preservation Agenda, Community Land Trust and Public-Private Partnerships. Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, let me make sure that mine doesn't mess up too. Hold on. I hope that that looks okay. Um, if somebody, if it doesn't, somebody please tell me. Great job. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much um, for having me just to reiterate what Fallon said in such illustrious company. Um, I will just in the interest of time kind of dive straight in um, with uh, this statement that I think preservation has an image problem. It's evolved significantly from its early days of elitism and representing monumental, monumentalist narratives of, you know, dead white men, but um, you only need to kind of scan the preservation related headlines to see that the discipline is still uh, accused of being exclusionary, um, elitist, and in opposition to equity. Uh, preservation supporters and critics increasingly demand greater and more comprehensive inclusion of uh, minority um, and marginalized communities within the preservation process to ensure fair distribution um, of preservation's costs and benefits. Uh, given the current climate of political and social unrest and dialogue, ignoring, I think, such a clarion call threatens to stagnate the preservation field and its contributions to contemporary issues, um, as well as substantiate accusations that the field is incompatible with equity, uh, when in reality, preservation, I think, can contribute rather than detract from equity and justice. Um, so what is an equi equity preservation agenda? Um, equity preservation is a process uh, through which historically marginalized groups exercise greater participatory agency in identifying, elevating, and protecting the place-based histories of racial, ethnic, gender, income, and class-based groups. So what that means then is that an equity preservation approach, it works towards distributive and perhaps reparative parity with regard to both process and outcomes. And in doing so, uh, I think preservationists can actually enable outcomes that provide a counter narrative to these perceptions of elitism, exclusion, and really place preservation at the front of current conservation um, or current conversations surrounding social justice and equity. So the question then is, but how? <laughs> we always have this question of, okay, that's great, but how do we do this? What does that actually mean in real terms? Um, and so the bulk of the, the next couple of minutes I'm going to talk about um, are going to kind of get down to the nitty gritty of trying to respond to that question of but how. Um, so it could be a little bit technical, but I think it's really important for us to kind of try to dig into that question and try to understand how we can actually implement an equity preservation agenda rather than it being something that we just talk about. So I'm proposing two tools of many um, that I think have great potential to respond to this question, which are community land trusts and public-private people partnerships. So the first one, community land trusts, um, apologies again if this is a bit technical, but a quick introduction or a refresher of the CLT concept. Um, so in this context, uh, CLTs um, are used to preserve and protect affordable housing in particular. Um, they're used in other realms too to protect land and other other um, forms of assets. But in this in this context, we're talking about affordable housing, and it does this by separating the value of land from the building on top of it. So the institutional arrangement is one in which 
there are a group of people, usually citizens or nonprofits and government to varying degrees, that create a trust that owns the land but sells the house. And in an ownership model, the homeowners buy the home or the structure at an affordable price and with restrictions on use and resale. Uh, and then they engage in a long-term lease of the land, usually around 99 years, with title to the land held by the trust. Now this is two things. It lowers the purchase price and, just, and preserves long-term affordability of the home when it compares to market rate increases. Uh, but for the homeowner, when they sell, they recoup the increase in value and any increases from improvements. And it can be written into any the CLT arrangements, requirements, or opportunities for counseling, education, financial classes, or other tools to really kind of level the playing field for those buying into the CLT um, itself, as well as increase their um, sort of knowledge of how to actually navigate um, the housing market. Uh, benefits, I won't go into all of these, but um, expanding access to home ownership, especially for low and moderate income homeowners, um, giving them access to the housing market itself, um, preserving access to home ownership and maintaining affordability, especially in communities um, where investment of public dollars has expanded home ownership um, for those people, particularly those excluded from markets. It enhances security of tenure. Um, for first time home, homeowners in particular, stabilizes residential neighborhoods, uh, builds personal assets, um, protects public assets, creates social capital, expands civic engagement, um, it enables personal mobility um, by putting more money in the pockets of the, of particularly of low income or moderate income households, um, promotes development and particularly it promotes diversity um, from a neighborhood scale as well. Um, so we have mixed income neighborhoods or just um, neighborhoods that are adjacent to each other um, that have less kind of uh, more equitable distribution of benefits between them. Um, those are just some of the benefits of um, the CLT. So why CLTs and preservation? Uh, simply put, a lot of housing stock is um, left right for affordable housing is old. And much of it has historic value, designated or undesignated. So CLTs in particular can address this displacement associated with gentrification and historic preservation, um, but it can also, by, and it does this by providing affordable housing and simultaneously retaining the historicity of housing stock. So it's these two twin goals of affordable housing and preservation that we are uh, addressing here. And in doing so, going back to my earlier point, on the preservation end in our, our image problem, we're countering these kind of elitist perceptions of preservation as a field by um, providing increased access to equity um, within the process of the CLT and outcomes. Um, just one example of a CLT that is doing this, the oldest CLT in the country <coughs> and the largest, excuse me, um, its preservation is explicitly uh, Champlain Housing Trust founded in 1984. Um, but interestingly enough, for those of you who are familiar with the CLT world, preservation is not in its specific mission. And in interviews with employees and the director, they corroborated that preservation is not an explicit goal of theirs, but they nonetheless understand that history and heritage and preservation within the built environment is part of the community and um, part of building healthy, thriving communities. Um, this is just an example of Willard Mill that was a former factory converted into 28 affordable homes. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the largest DLT in the nation. Um, Two thirds of their sellers go on to buy in the private market. They have lower rates of foreclosure. Um, they also have numerous uh, buildings that they manage themselves as rental housing for the city's workforce, as well as people on fixed incomes. Um, so they serve both the rental and the home ownership market. Um, and a number of their projects are actually focused on specific uh, communities at risk. So focused on people coming out of homelessness or abusive relationships or have that people, communities that have other needs of social services. So in this realm, CLTs really are a way to provide both historic preservation and affordable housing. Um, and in doing so, they're providing access to housing, 
Um, they're providing access to markets uh, and actual physical spaces that may have been uh, kind of barred, that these communities may have been barred from before. Um, so it's really a question of, you know, former other, other panelists have, you know, mentioned the word inclusion and exclusion. Um, so CLTs in this, in this vein are really an element or a, a, a tool for inclusion um, and shifting the balance towards economic, social, and physical equity. Um, so the second tool that I have mentioned is public-private partnerships. I won't read this long definition, um, but the important thing to take away from it is that it's a public-private partnership is a contractual agreement between a public agency and a private sector entity in which these partners share and exchange risk, reward, and responsibility. Uh, and they usually combine public sector responsibilities um, and, own, home and, uh, home and ownership, excuse me, um, with private sector innovation and efficiency through a long-term contractual obligation. So PPPs have been pioneered, um, or 3Ps, uh, have been pioneered and extensively used in infrastructure projects. Um, think roads, waste management, um, but they're gaining traction in the heritage world and they're used in the heritage scope primarily in rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of single buildings um, up all the way up to entire neighborhoods or districts. So just to dig into a little bit more of what PPPs are and what each partner kind of brings to the table, um, most PPPs, uh, 3Ps, involve long-term leases, immediate or eventual transfer of responsibility back to the public sector, um, long-term management through a long-term lease um, is usually held by the private sector as in, in because um, the private sector is most capable of handling the risk for redevelopment. Um, ownership, again, is held by the, the public sector usually. But the important thing is that all parties are really contributing the assets and the skills within their particular purview of expertise and taking on the appropriate amount of risk and responsibility um, in order to reap their desired rewards. So what does this mean for heritage? Um, it is... In the traditional 3P that we just talked about, we have, the public usually means the government and sometimes local citizens. Um, and heritage is kind of loosely fit into that the, the public um, sphere right there. Um, but it, in, in the private sector usually means a developer. Um, this 4P partnership where we have people added in there, um, it elevates citizens to the same level as the other partners and really differentiates government from its citizens, which in certain environments can be incredibly important um, to differentiate governments from the citizens. Um, and in this 4P uh, um, uh, sort of diagram here, we have the third sector usually provides oversight, advocacy, and heritage expertise rather than just serving in a consultative role rather than just being asked um, or provided um, a, a sort of response. And it, these, from an institutional perspective, they usually take on the form of nonprofit organization. Um, and if we really want to center issues of equity and justice, then we need to include people in these kinds of regenerative projects. So in the 4P realm, the US honestly doesn't have a very good track record uh, of including citizen organizations in these kinds of projects in a really meaningful way. Um, and it, they tend to be very real estate based or transactional. So um, turning to a quick international example um, that does kind of center people at a more um, equal way, we go to Quito at the Historic Center in Ecuador. Um, it's uh, beginning in the 1970s. Quito's historic center was in complete disrepair. Um, for those of you who don't know, his, the, the uh, Quito's historic center was the first World Heritage City to be listed in 1978. Um, it's incredibly beautiful uh, colonial architecture, um, but you can see in these images, you know, what it looked like in the 1970s. Um, fast forward to the 1990s, 1994, um, the city uh, went, uh, entered into an agreement with the Inter-American Development Bank for a $41 million loan, the creation of a mixed capital company called the Historic Center Enterprise. It was really focused on real estate opportunities um, to regenerate public buildings there. Um, just to give you an overview, uh, they are, it's estimated that the ECH's um, efforts catalyzed nearly $12 million in private investment. Um, and the 
there was a, the public private partner was the city as well as the national government in part and the private partner was the um, a local foundation. Um, they're geared towards creating, you know, a, a revitalizing or regenerating the entire historic center and it included financial incentives um, that have tax exemptions for the differences between original and improved property values. Um, they matched investments and in, through grants and loan programs as well. They ensured that a number of their public projects uh, were geared towards at-risk communities like um, prostitutes and providing daycare or childcare for their children. Um, so really focused on at-risk communities there. Um, that said, it was not a perfect project by any means. Um, there was gentrification, instability of government changes, et cetera, et cetera. But we have learned a great deal from this project in terms of how we can uh, combine preservation um, and again, these social and equity-minded goals within this context of a 4P partnership by placing the, um, the well-being of communities, especially low-income or at-risk communities, on parity with the public and private um, partners. So just to wrap up, um, the, at a practical level, we need to make sure that, that um, whether we're talking about CLTs or PPPs, that these and other tools are a good fit for their market and governance conditions. There needs to be checks and balances along the way to ensure that the both that all of the partners um, are abiding by uh, the responsibilities, but they're also re reaping the benefits that they should be. Um, and we need to make sure that local communities are being privileged. So again, you know, these tools are not perfect. They're not a panacea, but when they're used thoughtfully and deliberately and with care towards inclusion of these traditionally excluded, of those traditionally excluded in the process. Um, and in that process, the creation of opportunities or services along the way um, that can encourage parity where it's lacking. Uh, I think these tools um, and others like it can really facilitate equitable outcomes um, and move us towards a, an equity preservation agenda. So with that, I will end. I've gone a little bit over time, sorry. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was really interesting to sort of hear two different um, tools on different sides of um, the market and non-market options of, of different tools that can be used and um, some really concrete examples. Um, I'll say in the chat, um, there is a request for your definition of equity preservation. So if you wouldn't mind typing that in the chat for all of us to have on record. Um, and I'll just say before uh, we go on to the next speaker that we are a little bit behind time for this panel. So I'll ask if the next two panelists can try to um, not necessarily cut it short, but but um, be efficient with your time so that we have time at the end for um, questions, um, which I think in this panel should be really interesting. So Fallon, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. And I appreciate everyone's um being so working with me here. All right, you should see you should see a presentation. <laughs> yes, correct? yay. Uh, yay, great. All, good. All right. So I'm not going to um, go too much into my previous remarks, but just to say that um, I'm very privileged to present a small part of a project that is um, derivative of both my background, having grown up in a black settlement within a native place, Piscataway, New Jersey, and working with um, grassroots preservationists in two places where um, African-American heritage is being actively preserved by um, native organizations and nations. Um, and I'm speaking today about work in Greenwood um, Tulsa, where the Indian Nation Council of Governments is a critical resource in preservation planning. And it's been a tough year to launch a new inquiry in partnership with grassroots preservationists. Still, our preliminary investigations of cottage businesses um, who uh, past and present have yielded fresh insights into the many, many organizational structures, management strategies, and um, architectural spaces that shape Black heritage preservation, from churches to chambers of commerce and community development corporations. And so I uh, 
I've noticed in a lot of the conversations that we've been having as people of color in this field, who've been asked to serve on task force and initiative, you know, thought roundtables and such, that um, across the country and U.S. territories, many people of color are losing cultural heritage to historic storms and human threats. But um, much of the media attention is interested in minoritized heritage that in one particular place this particular year. In less than uh, four months, journalists will flood Tulsa's Greenwood Historic District to recount a white mob's violent destruction of Black Wall Street by arsonist and armed uh, terrorist, really, on May 30th, 1921. And to a lesser degree, the media will retell the story of Black families, philanthropists, and entrepreneurs that rebuilt this Negro business district despite living with grief and living in retreat. And who can blame them? Um, the Greenwood Community Development Corporation, the organization fiduciarily responsible for restoring and registering um, the 10 historic buildings anchoring a pending National Register Historic District nomination uh, for this area is not even mentioned in rather recent historic context statements and historic resource surveys that include those buildings and their neighbors. Just last year, one year before the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial, the CDC received a half million dollar NPS Nest Preservation Grant to commission architectural documentation and restore its architectural assets. The only remaining commercial buildings that Black Tulsans rebuilt on Greenwood Avenue after the massacre. And while architectural, archeological and archival surveys render assets of Greenwood's Chamber of Commerce and Community Development Corporation vital to rebuilding public memory of Black Wall Street, these surveys and the institutional grants and individual giving they have prompted largely overlooked the CDC's concrete markers of heritage management and the chamber's contributions to remembrance of people, property, and places lost and gained during the massacre. And one should note uh, that it wasn't just violence that took things during the massacre and resulted in mass graves, but quite a bit of state violence that resulted in a loss of property and shelter, quite literally. So the chamber's history of uh, land acquisition, ownership, leasing, development, and disposition is to some extent captured in a forthcoming atlas powered by ArcGIS and the brilliance of uh, Tulsa archaeologists and geographers who are mostly interested in chronicling slum clearance and Negro removal at the hands of Tulsa's renewal authority and displacement and development at the behest of the state's educational institutions and the city's preservation commission. And, you know, they have quite a bit <laughs> on their plate uh, in terms of chronicling a century of spatial transformation and social change. And so it's not um, at issue on their part that it does not delve into the particular history of this chamber, but it is unfortunate. Um, Tulsa's leading African-American businessmen founded this mutual aid society after Oklahoma statehood in 1907 but for generations since, Black Tulsans have managed the chamber's land and building investments, as well as its land tenancy and building tenants. And much of that time frame, they've done their work without historic tax credits or any traditional avenues for preservation to be involved in economic justice. And so what have been their strategies? Um, and so this is, I think, worth us taking a closer look. And they prim primarily have revolved around land holding and land development, property holding and um, tenant development. And so these are 
things that we as a field um, kind of marginally study. More importantly, um, there are areas of inquiry that we lack a lot of tools to study. But one of the two that I find uh, particularly instructive in this case is the organization's use of land leases and to a lesser extent easements um, as a means by which to leverage co-investment in um, oncoming and development within their district, i.e. encroachment or under some rubrics, gentrification. And the ways in which they have um, constructed these legal arrangements is <laughs> partly a matter of just grassroots crowdsourcing the financial resources to compensate the legal experts that support them in their work. And the other is by um, maintaining through like kind of physical maintenance activities um, as well as economic ones, a the footprint of the or kind of original or historical business district of Greenwood and maintaining the sense that this um, community of entrepreneurship has always existed here and should continue to exist here into the future, even if the buildings that once housed those businesses are now gone. But those are kind of things that tinker around the edges um, in terms of providing financial resources, as well as um, kind of constructing a public memory of entrepreneurship and um, economic development. What's been vital, absolutely vital to the work that they do um, in even one site is their ability to, uh, and their willingness, we'll say, to sell the land that they have acquired over the generations of remaining active in a community that's seen so much divestment. And so after the urban renewal period of the 1960s, the city and the state held a lot of land in the area and seeded it in a series of uh, property transactions to Greenwood Chamber of Commerce and the Greenwood Community Development Corporation. Some of these transfers um, took place as part of a, um, you know, a community economic development initiative on the part of the state, but um, most of it was just kind of uh, just land dis disposition, uh, not by auction, by kind of zero dollar, one dollar exchanges between the chamber and the city. As a result, the chamber had what, as of this moment, we have yet to confirm exactly how many properties were owned at one point. Um, and one might ask, well, there are sand, you know, there are Sandborn maps and assessors' records and tax records. Like, how is that not possible? How is that possible that one doesn't have that kind of record of such a large owner of historic assets in a in a community? Um, and there are two reasons for that that I'm going to come back to. But I, I want to note first that in acquiring all of these, the actual nature of their ownership wasn't necessarily a um, all out free and clear ownership so much as a uh, kind of ownership by which you have a fiscal sponsor or a fiscal agent. Because as much as the city and state divested from the actual responsibility of maintaining and developing land within Greenwood, they didn't divest from their position that the business owners of this community weren't worthy of having total control over the landscape that they stewarded. And so you have uh, what we know to be a tinkering on the, along the edges of this historic district, a selling of residential properties that house cottage, business, cottage businesses um, in the kind of middle of the, the, top, the left image, and a, uh, the sale of larger commercial buildings 
closer to the downtown core, ultimately resulting in the chamber owning just the 10 structures that it has now. And so what these property sales allowed the organization to do is establish a land lease praxis um, where they capture land and then release it to certain degrees to uh, whether through sublease or through uh, a full sale with covenants or a sale with lease back provisions. And so one of the latest additions of this work has been um, a project called um, under the auspices of Green Arch LLC and that now houses the Black Wall Street Gallery and anchors um, what was once vacant land, uh, this very important corner of Greenwood Avenue's commercial corridor. So if the northern, east and west sides of Greenwood um, house those 10 buildings under the chamber's control, the other two corner lots were vacant, but held by the chamber for decades. The, this one, this mixed use development was built on one in 2011 and currently a history center um, that enables people to engage with the heritage of this wider area is being built on the other. But the, the first one I think is worthy of considering how it is vital to the chamber having a sustaining revenue source. And so quarterly, it receives the revenues of this particular development. And so finally, I'll just note that these strategies of capital investment in LLCs and in land development strategies, even naming rights practices are things that we don't tend to think of as part of a preservation organization's scope of work, but they're vital to the way in which it works and the way in which preservation might actually work out for communities of color. And so we, I think as whether we're community development scholars or preservation professionals um, need to take a closer look at what methods we and tools we use to, uh, to assess the value of cultural institutions uh, managing cultural assets. Thank you. Thank you, Fallon. That is a fascinating presentation, especially in light of where we are with Tulsa and, Green, and the Greenwood Massacre 100 years later, but also fascinating in comparison with Caroline's presentation, which was focusing on community land trust as one particular tool. And I think your focus on land preservation on the commercial side, as opposed to the residential side, offers from some interesting comparisons. Um, that hopefully we'll have time to engage in the Q&A. Um, I will note that there's a question in the chat for Caroline and given our time right now, I invite you to do um, to answer those live so we can have an ongoing chat in the, in, um, the, um, the chat box if we don't have as much time to engage in person. All right, so moving on to Laura, um, we have um, a present, her presentation is titled Still Here in a Changing City, the Origins of San Francisco's Legacy Business Program. Thank you so much. All right, how does that view look? Do we have just the, the first slide? No, it's on presenter mode. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, this worked a few days ago. Let's see. Um, you could try again. Let's see. It should just share on my. How does that? Is it still it's, showing my notes? It's on presenter notes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you mind just for ease uh, to move us along if we if I stop sharing and I'll just use my version so I can read my notes on mine and if we share. Yes, let me double check if Karen, did you upload it onto the Google Drive? It's for Karen of you. Oh, she's bringing it up for you. Okay, great. Just Thank tell you. Tell her where to go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
Um, so thank you again to Michelle and to the University of Maryland um, for inviting me. It's such an honor to share a virtual space with all of you. Um, for the next few minutes, I'm going to piece together the story of how advocates in San Francisco rallied around the city's intangible cultural heritage in the last decade and how these efforts to conserve legacy businesses shaped my trajectory as an early career preservation professional. Next slide. Legacy businesses are longtime commercial establishments that contribute to a sense of history in their surrounding neighborhoods. They are social and cultural touchstones, often providing vital services and goods that are otherwise absent in a particular area. They sustain traditional knowledge and practices, and they might also possess distinctive design that enhances neighborhood character, but the value of legacy businesses comes from what they do or provide rather than how they look. Next slide. Outside the US, the notion of protecting longtime establishments belongs to heritage frameworks that recognize how tangible and intangible expressions of the past are intertwined. Since the late 90s, cities like Buenos Aires, Paris, London, and Barcelona have developed successful policies and programs to help maintain significant businesses, nonprofits, and other cultural institutions. Next slide. In 2012, San Francisco Heritage created the first preservation initiative in the US designed to draw attention to mainstays of memory, culture, and belonging that were at risk of disappearing. Known as legacy bars and restaurants, the program argued that landmark designation and related tools were insufficient for protecting commercial heritage from displacement and that the city needed new criteria and incentives to stem the tide of loss. This was new ground for SF Heritage, which had for 40 years focused most of its advocacy and education efforts on the city's architectural heritage. Now the nonprofit, its community partners, and preservation commissioners argue that historic businesses stabilized and knit together San Francisco's neighborhoods and thus deserve public investment amidst unprecedented real estate speculation and development. Next slide. This argument was persuasive. In 2015, the city of San Francisco established the Legacy Business Registry, which became the first designation program for intangible cultural heritage in the US. Since then, 300 businesses have joined the program and gained access to grants and technical assistance enabled by the voter approved Legacy Business Historic Preservation Fund. The idea is gaining traction in cities across the Western region. The cities of San Antonio and Seattle, for example, have created legacy business programs, and the city of Los Angeles is also studying the idea. Next slide. But rather than delve further into the nuts and bolts of these programs, I'd like to return to the grassroots origins of the movement for legacy businesses. My talk will emphasize the crucial roles of neighborhood advocates, small business owners, families, and nonprofit leaders in advocating for local government partnership. I'll describe how these efforts shaped my early career and close with some thoughts about how conserving legacy businesses might be a strategy for unmaking entrenched social, economic, and racial inequities in our cities. Next slide. So just a quick note on my positionality. So, oh, previous slide, yeah, there's a blank one, thank you. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles County. I'm a third generation Mexican-American or Chicana and grew up in a family that had experienced intense pressure to assimilate. As a young person, I often felt a fragile connection to my own heritage, but I was also raised among storytellers and learned to piece together a sense of place and belonging from fragments. Next slide. I pursued a master's in heritage conservation at USC and studied grassroots heritage organizing in East LA, which is a majority Latinx neighborhood that was one of the birthplaces of the Chicano movement. Um, and a number of the ideas that I explored in that work have stayed with me, including the idea of self-determination as an organizing principle for conservation. Um, but that field work also taught me to tread lightly and to seek out co-creation of knowledge and process wherever possible while acknowledging my in-between or outsider position. Next slide. In 2012, I was hired as the Communications and Programs Manager at SF Heritage. There, I joined two visionary colleagues, Mike Bueller and Desiree Aranda, who were helping reimagine the possibilities of preservation in San Francisco. In general, San Francisco enjoyed more widespread public support for preservation than my hometown. The city boasts strong protections for historic buildings, and its distinctive architectural identity draws its residents together. San Franciscans also claim a long tradition of progressive politics that encourages diversity and free thinking. Next slide. But by the early 2010s, socioeconomic disparity was widening as a new tech boom fueled the city's recovery from the recession. A 2014 study by the Brookings Institute confirmed that the city had one of the highest rates of income inequality in the country, with the gap between the wealthiest and poorest segments of the population growing faster than in any other U.S. city. In 2013, San Francisco's rents climbed more than three times the national average. Studies in public outcry focused on the city's housing crisis, but the conversation left out businesses, nonprofits, and other cultural institutions that were closing their doors. Next slide. 
SF Heritage created the Legacy Bars and Restaurants program because a clear pattern was emerging. Beloved businesses were shuddering because they simply could not compete in the rental market and not enough of them owned their own buildings. Many also struggled to pay their workers enough to meet the cost of living. But instead of jumping in with policy ideas, we decided to celebrate a category of businesses that enjoyed a lot of public support and spark a conversation about why they mattered. Our criteria were broad and we underscored diversity. Next slide. This was truly a shoestring effort at first. We had very limited resources and promoted mostly through social media and word of mouth. We began with an online map featuring 25 locations and expanded over a year and a half to include 100 businesses, a printed map, and a window decal. Beyond our tight resources, we faced a number of other challenges. For example, we had to address the perception of preservationists among small business owners, especially among people of color. Many were understandably suspicious of our motives, worried about an unfamiliar organization trying to tell their story, and anxious about the unintended effects of publicity. In order to build trust, I went door to door to nearly every business in the program, had conversations, and in many cases earned enough confidence for them to share their stories and archival materials for us to publish. If they objected, we respected those boundaries. We also lacked expertise in small business economics, so we relied on the knowledge and experiences of proprietors to guide us into our position as conveners. Next slide. At the same time, SF Heritage was developing partnerships with community-based organizations in the Mission District, South of Market, and Japantown, which were each independently studying the ways that gentrification and, display, uh, and development were eroding cultural heritage and seeking out new conservation studies and tools. So this was the larger prism through which my colleague Desiree and I saw the legacy program. The momentum within the local preservation movement was coming from communities of color, but organizers were siloed. Next slide. In June of 2013, SF Heritage hosted a day-long community summit which brought together community leaders, preservation professionals, cultural workers, and business owners. Our goals were wide-ranging and we were especially concerned with creating an apparatus of mutual support and communication um, and coordination among different organized groups. Presenters from Japantown, The Mission, Soma, Chinatown, and The Bayview explained how cultural heritage assets supported their neighborhood economies, promoted intergenerational understandings, and fostered pride of place. We also convened a round table of small business experts, planners, and city officials to discuss ideas for creating a citywide legacy business program. Next slide. Nearly every attendee reported that their communities were in crisis due to skyrocketing rents and evictions, as well as underinvestment in aging building stock, diminishing numbers of heritage practitioners, competition from chain retail, leadership transitions, and out migrations of ethnic populations. The leadership succession piece really resonated with me as we heard emotional stories about the descendants of longtime proprietors struggling with the expectation that they would take over the family business. And so this really inspired us to explore apprenticeship models as well. Collectively, participants brainstormed a set of specific recommendations, which I've summarized on the slide. Uh, next slide. In the aftermath of the summit, SF Heritage conducted interviews and policy research, folding our findings into the 2014 report, Sustaining San Francisco's Living History. We continued having public facing conversations through news and social media. There was renewed interest in a citywide intangible heritage program, but we did get pushback from people who balked at the concept of public investment in small independent businesses, despite the city's generous tax policies for incoming tech companies. Next slide. It's also blank. I left FSF Heritage just as we released the report, so I've observed its life from Los Angeles. In the years since, I've encountered both curiosity in and resistance to legacy business programming. In some ways, the idea of conserving and historic use threatens to upend successful narratives about adaptive reuse in the mainstream field. But I'm also encouraged to see a loosening of boundaries between tangible and intangible heritage in California and a growing acknowledgement of the myriad ways that our communities inherit and sustain the past. Next slide. Currently, I'm interested in how changes in the political landscape of the last few years enable us to frame legacy businesses in different ways. For example, rather than speaking of fairness between big and small businesses, we might now argue that public investment in historic BIPOC businesses is a form of justice or repair for communities that have struggled against discriminatory financial and real estate practices. We might see legacy business programs as a way of building and supporting generational wealth in black and brown neighborhoods, which have suffered disproportionate losses in the pandemic atop historical injustices. And we might prioritize relief for legacy businesses that provide essential services as we reassess what vital means in our neighborhoods. Any hint of quote unquote wealth redistribution would have been a non-starter just a few years ago, but as critiques of racial capitalism grow ever louder, the doors open to new conversations. Next slide. 
And we've already begun to see this thinking in San Francisco. We should continue paying attention to what happens there as the city wrestles with how to rebuild its local economy by investing in local traditions of innovation. How will the city reframe its support for the 300 plus businesses in the registry? And will others be able to access those benefits? How can we connect their longevity to other issues tied to racial and social justice, such as housing, living wages, and public health and safety? Next slide. Um, so in recent months, I've thought a lot about what's been taken from us in terms of embodied cultural knowledge and traditional practices over the last year. Our communities have lost too many keepers of our heritage to the pandemic. And on a practical level, this will only make things like succession planning and apprenticeships more important as we look to rebuild. But I'll end on a more optimistic note. I think we were successful in San Francisco because we aspired to a citywide constituency, because many of the ideas came from neighborhood advocates, and because preservationists both championed the issues and yielded their time to other voices and collaborative community, or other voices and thinkers, excuse me. Legacy business programs require robust and collaborative community processes. I think we preservationists bring so much of ourselves and our own knowledge to this work, but we do our best work when we amplify, learn from, and create with present practitioners at the margins. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that was really fascinating, both from the perspective of you having been so deeply involved in this project, but also in thinking about it alongside Fallon's work on commercial businesses um, in Greenwood and the different tools um, that are at use at play in both places. So, Michelle, I just want to do a quick time check. We're almost at time. Do we have time for a quick five or 10 minute discussion? Sure. Okay. I'll give you, I'll give you uh, 10 minutes. Awesome. Thank I'll you so much. Break between sessions. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> All right. So um, please put your um, comments in the chat and I will monitor that. And as well, if there's any comments that are coming out of the Google box uh, of the Google Doc, if somebody could please raise them as well. Um, I will uh, Caroline, thank you for answering the question that we have on the table in the chat. And I will just raise that, um, give you a little time to speak on that, but also add to it because I think there's some nice intersections with um, the other presentations. So the, the comment in the chat was really about whether or not CLTs could work well in areas that had already faced rapid gentrification, like where we're like where we're sitting in the Washington DC area. Is it feasible to get these in place after um, gentrification has reached its mid or latter stage? And I might also ask some of the other present presenters to weigh in on how your tools um, what how the, your tools work in the face of rapid gentrification. I'm struck um, in Fallon's case by a recent article on Tulsa that I read where um, the issue of gentrification of black owned businesses was right at the fore um, and the kind of cultural marketing and branding that is currently happening around black Wall Street and a lack of actual black ownership of those businesses. And then clearly in the case of Laura's, this is a tool that is very much at the heart of maintaining legacy businesses in one of the most rapidly gentrified cities in America. And so um, given that you are in the early, you know, this is one of the earliest um, legacy, small, um, legacy business programs, did the fact that you started this early on in San Francisco's process of gentrification help its long-term impacts? Um, so I'll just jump in and kind of reiter reiterate what I said in the chat that um, it, I think CLTs for equity purposes and the purposes that we're talking them, about them, um, I mean, it's all about context, right? If you have a city that is all that is already like 100% gentrified, the question is really, well, wh are, where are you trying to retain affordability, right? You wouldn't go into like Park Avenue or Fifth Avenue or something and try to create a CLT there, unless, unless we are lived in a wild world where the rest of the city's property values were escalating at astronomical rates, and, and Park City sudden, I mean, and Park Avenue suddenly became the most affordable place to live, right? It's all about context. So, um, in a in a, in a in an area or in a city that is already gentrified, um, it's, it's really just a question of, well, what, what would you be trying to preserve at that point, right? 
um, if you are trying to, to sort of limit or put a ceiling on escalating property values, um, then it, it might. Um, but so it really depends on the context of, of not just um, that neighborhood, but the, where that context sits um, from a real estate value with the rest of the city and the rest of uh, its, its neighborhood, its neighbors, right? It's not just sort of um, something that you would do in isolation. Um, so there really has to be, and I guess this is a long way of saying there has to be some kind of comparative um, threat in some way. Um, it, threat might be too strong, but it just, it needs to be, there needs to be some kind of comparison that you're trying, in which you're trying to preserve the housing in that specific neighborhood versus another, I guess, is, is um, the short answer to that. Laura or Fallon, you want to jump in here? Um, I, I think I can, you know, answer your question about uh, the tools by which we we look at what's going on and we address them with the at the rate of change going on. And what I'm finding is that the rate of change now is yes quicker in um, in many respects than the past. But actually, if we think about the the pace at which land takings took. Um, occurred in 1970s and 80s, um, especially as certain members of a city's population became more affluent and cash um, liquid and others did not, they, you know, there was a lot of moving and shaking, if you will. And that, the ways by which we research those periods of time can be just as useful in this moment. Um, and so one of the things I've learned from scholars who do work on um, business, changes in business activity in the 1980s, um, in the kind of boom years of Main Streets then is that, you know, not all Main Streets, obviously, uh, is that there's, um, there's a need for us to really push for better uh, documentation of business um, investment and and building investment. And so there's may not be black owned businesses and black owned buildings um, in a kind of colloquial sense, but there are many cases in which there's 30% ownership and people are getting K-1s quarterly, telling them, you know, showing that they still have a stake in this place. And that financial stake becomes integral to larger commer commercial and community development initiatives. And in order to build those diasporic networks when needed to address a more kind of formidable threat, uh, we need to know what those networks are. So that's one tool, those kind of business um, analytics. Great, thank you. And Laura, before you jump in, I just wanted to add um, to your question, um, if you could also respond to Max's question about um, specifically where you can't actually regulate use, um, how do you preserve neighborhood serving institutions such as barbershops? Um, okay, so let's see if I can string all of the different questions together and answer quickly. So I think in terms of the timing, we were really fortunate in that we managed, there, had, there was a, conver a public conversation happening citywide about the loss of these kinds of places. And I think this wasn't the first time there had been a sort of upswell of speculative development. This had happened in San Francisco before. Um, and so I think this time that added to the motivation for why there needed to be some kind of concerted effort. And I think we made a really kind of conscious effort while certainly pushing for a kind of citywide program that would um, allow, you know, communities across the city to access benefits, we, when we were developing our policy report and looking into things like land trusts and community benefits agreement, you know, these kinds of public-private partnership, we wanted to be basically create a toolkit for communities to be able to, or neighborhoods, to be able to decide, to decide what would work best for them. So, um, and, and to think about the legacy business program itself, not as adding additional regulation, but being completely incentive-based, that it was something that people could opt into um, that would think about, you know, that would evaluate places um, through a more kind of flexible lens um, and think about helping to support both property owners and uh, the, the, the businesses that they rented to. Um, so I encourage, just to kind of answer the question quickly the, to the person who, um, you know, is asking about how to regulate, uh, how to 
incentivize and support, I would encourage you to look at the report itself because we've got quite a few recommendations in there. Um, and some of it just start in some cases just starts with the you know, neighborhood education campaigns around trying to encourage people to patronize businesses if we aren't at a place of being able to regulate. I think there's a sort of understanding that we sort of support, there was this mutual uh, apparatus of support that I mentioned that, that we can as private citizens, as consumers, we can make decisions about where we put our money and that sometimes you know, in the absence of government being able to respond that we can kind of take on the, we can, we can help contribute in those ways too. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I think we're probably down to our last question here and I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions that we have in the chat in doing so. Um, Alex, I don't think we're gonna to get to your workforce development question. So maybe if Caroline can um, respond to that directly, but I wanted to raise a question um, that both Gail DeBrow and Clara Arazabal um, asked about um, sort of pushing the fields of preservation and planning a little bit closer together, but through the lens um, of what Caroline brought us to at the beginning of her presentation around an equitable development agenda that really thinks about reparative and distributional aspects in both process and outcome. So um, if you can, uh, if each of you can kind of speak to sort of those meshing of um, these fields or closer alignment of the fields and how we can continue to push that, but through some of those frames that Caroline introduced us to at the beginning of her talk. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and say, I think, so part of it is this question, I, I, looking at Gail's question specifically about reparations, is um, this, this issue of who, right, and who the communities are that we're including. And, and I think what I tried to really highlight, I think, is the importance and the value of um, the differences between just, uh, communities um, or the who being sort of involved in a sort of consultative way versus being truly involved and integrated integrative um, at the creationary point, right? At that point at which we are actually creating preservation programs. So kind of what Laura was talking about and in terms of involving local communities and um, in, in sort of not just involving them on the back end, right? And saying, hey, do you wanna come sit at this table that we have already built and created, right? So um, the CLT model that I, that I was focusing on, you know, involving local communities in the actual creation of the CLT or whatever the tool is that you're using, right? Is, that, is, is really just getting to that question of who you're really focusing on and the degree to which you are allowing them to, um, not allowing them, that's not the right, way, the right phrase, but involving them and integrating them into the preservation um, process. Because, you know, we all know that, you know, higher involvement in the creation and, um, and the actual process of something has, has you know, better results for um, equitable outcomes um, at the end, at the outset. I'd just like to add that I think that everything Caroline just said applies um, to two other arenas I think are highly critical to the intersection of preservation and planning, both higher ed, as Clara, um, she mentioned in the chat her question, um, and also to um, aid organizations, whether that's, you know, philanthropic, government grant, pro you know, programs, all of those programming um, can be constructed at the outset um, in partnership with the communities that they are ostensibly supposed to serve and support and sustain. And I think the, the fact that preservation does not have a national accrediting body like planning and architecture um, actually offers an opportunity for us to be far more creative and critical um, and responsive really to the, the challenges that communities and cultural um, heritage and cultural bearers are facing. And I'd particularly like to shout out that um, the work I've been doing with the African American Heritage Trail of Martha's Vineyard, where you have a public historian who runs the organization and has developed her own in, entirely own educational program. And, um, you know, there's a lot of reinventing the wheel that happens that her program has, served, has youth involved and there's adult education that's you know, involved in professional development and training people to work in the heritage fields. You know, we don't need to just refer to and look to each other. We can also, you know, source our programming from, from those um, on the ground. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. I think we are going to have to stop there. I see the other um, the other presenters joining us. Thank you, Michelle, for the extension of time for this rich discussion, and I hope that we can further it in the chat. Well, thank you, Willow, for your awesome moderating skills in this time, and thank you to all three panelists. I'm a fan of all of you, and I know this discussion and these presentations could be their own day-long series, right? Because it does pose, and I see in a lot of the Q&A with the title of this session, we are at the, what does it look like to be at the intersection, right, of preservation and planning as we're often seen divorced for some reason or really far distant cousins when we're not. So um, I invite folks, you know, there's a lot of questions. And so I'm going to ask um, the panelists who do, who haven't had a chance to answer, you know, maybe connect and answer in the, in the Google Doc later on, actually. So thank you again for everyone. And we're going to take a moment, um, a minute or actually we have two minutes <laughs> um, officially, but we're gonna switch over to our last panel discussion. So thank you again to Laura, Willow, Caroline, and Fallon, thank you.